I'm Benny Pakawa. I'm a Badger. Um, I'm also calling in from Capital Entrepreneurs, which is a Madison-based entrepreneurship group. This is a really special night. I've been looking forward to it for a long time. I'm really thankful for all of you who have joined us. I'm going to talk for a few minutes here as we wait for everybody to join us and get online, um, and then we'll get rolling. So back to things. Um, yeah, tonight is special. Not only is it likely one of the last events of the year, um, also one of the best events of the year, <laughs> one of the most informative, um, but it also marks a development in how we connect kind of as Badgers, um, as current and former Madisonians. Pandemic continued, right? We're, st we're still in it. Um, it's challenged us. It continues to challenge us to connect in new ways, to break down barriers, to reach across oceans. Um, tonight is one of those nights. And it's really cool to have people, badgers calling in from all over the world. Um, we're still here. Um, so thank you for being here to, to celebrate, uh, to collaborate, to be, to be ourselves. Um, I hope the discussions tonight carry, carry into your teams, um, carry to other badgers, um, and, and help touch the communities that, that you're engaged in. Um, yeah, continue spreading the Wisconsin idea. So um, before I do announce our host, um, our speakers, and how we're gonna set up the night, I'm gonna give a quick how-to for Zoom webinar. Um, so you might notice that uh, you can only see me right now. Um, we do have the other panelists here. Um, there is a Q&A down below. You can enter questions in whenever you want and we'll do our best to get to them. I will say that we have time at the end to come back and address questions. Um, and that's when we'll make sure, um, but, but feel free to drop the questions in. Also, um, we are recording for people who have joined us a few minutes here. Um, only our, us are being recorded, um, but we're doing this so we can share with other Badgers and people who weren't able to join us. So on that note, it is my honor to tell us how we're gonna do the event before I inv invite everybody on stage. So uh, we're gonna start with our featured guest, John Morridge, and our host, Dave Bunzel. And they're gonna talk about John's story, remarkable story. Then we have Tom and Remzi from the brand new College of Computer Data and Information Sciences coming to talk about that. And afterwards, we have our live Q&A, but we'll be able to, to really get into all of these questions. But on that note, um, it is time for our featured guest. Um, and, and so it's an honor for me to be able to introduce our host um, and our featured guest. So first our host, um, Dave Bunzel. Dave is a community builder. Uh, Dave has worked with standards organizations on the internet. At the end of the day, um, Dave brings people together, like us, we're here. <laughs> and with, with Dave, our featured guest, a badger who needs no introduction, so I'm not going to do it. Dave, over to you. Thanks, Benny. <clears throat> I'm delighted to be here with John. John and I last uh, probably met in person 15 years ago when he did a similar event, actually Tasha and he uh, did the event. I think many of you know that Tasha was supposed to be part of the presentation. She had a minor medical procedure and decided that uh, it'd be best to have John cover for her tonight. And so, um, but before I introduce John and I'm gonna be talking about a lot of different things with John, I wanna talk a little bit about um, Tasha because I think for many of us who have spouses, we, we understand that our spouses oftentimes have a very important influence uh, in, in a lot of the different things we do. And uh, as we were talking, uh, I got together with John and Tasha for a couple of weeks ago. I think we talked uh, for about an hour and a half about a little bit of their background for me to get a little bit of information on them. 
And Tasha's family actually had a very interesting business background. Uh, the, uh, her maiden name was Frankfurt. And Frankfurt had, uh, there was a company, the Frankfurt Company, Frankfurt Hardware Company. They were the largest wholesale wholesaler of hardware goods in the country, I believe? No, they, they were a hardware wholesaler, but uh, there were quite a few of them in, in that day, and they covered principally the Midwest. Okay, uh, but it was fairly large business, so I'm sure at her dinner table, she was hearing a lot about business, and some of that she could probably share with John, uh, as John was in his career. Um, they also, the family, her family uh, started the German American School, I believe. And well, they were they were uh, part of that. They were also uh, found helped found the uh, museum in downtown Milwaukee. Uh, he was uh, the one of her grandparents was an uh, amateur archaeologist and and uh, and had dug up a lot of ad, uh, uh, ad, artifacts mm -hmm. in Italy. And uh, so they were very much a part of the. That was back before pizza, by the way. That was back in the days where they uh, brought beer at lunch. And uh, they would actually go to the uh, to past, uh, and they had uh, buckets. They brought it back in buckets. Uh, I don't know if that was a fundamental building block of the success of the company, but I'm sure it had some influence on uh, the energy put forth by their uh, employees. And John and I shared, we had a little bit of overlap there. My dad was an apprentice brewmaster for Paps, and he was one of the ones who had to bring the beer to the uh, big brewmeisters who were eating their Limburger cheese sandwiches. But uh, but John, talking a little bit about things, I, I you, you had an interesting childhood in Wisconsin. Maybe you can share a little bit about what childhood was, was like for you, where you were living, what uh, your family was like, and your background. Yeah, we... we uh... I, I can only remember Wauwatosa. Uh, actually, I was born in Elmhurst, Illinois, but very shortly thereafter, we moved to uh, Stickney Avenue off of uh, Wisconsin, Wauwatosa Avenue in uh, kind of central Wauwatosa, just uh, about uh, half a dozen blocks from uh, uh, grade, school, grade school and uh, high school. Uh, and I would say it, uh, uh, it was a, a pretty interesting environment to grow up in. Uh, and uh, uh, a lot of freedom in terms of what you could do. I, uh, I had a whole series of jobs, starting with a paper route, which I think is almost fundamental to period people of my era who were six, have been successful. You had to have uh, uh, had a paper route. It taught you a lot of things about uh, self-discipline, but it also uh, uh, underlined the value of a penny. You know, that was back when every door you hit with the Milwaukee Sentinel in the morning was a couple of pennies in your pocket. Uh, did a lot of biking, even as a youngster. Uh, did a lot of camping, canoed a lot of rivers, starting with the Wisconsin and the Chippewa, the Flambeau, uh, parts of the Mississippi. Uh, so quite a bit of outdoor, outdoor activity. Uh, the other job I had early on was polishing cars washing and polishing cars. And then I spent um, three summers in high school at the Teeny Weeny Pea Factory in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. Uh, we, I was paid 75 cents an hour, but we worked 16 hour days. Uh, uh, we worked uh, on uh, uh, stocking inventory during the day and then we cleaned the plant at night with uh, high-powered hoses. Uh, I subsequently went on to uh, 
spent some time sorting mail in downtown Milwaukee, had a wonderful job at the Paps Brewery, cleaning the uh, uh, walls in the malt house, uh, learned how to drink beer and how it could be a little unstabling if you drank beer in an environment that was held at uh, 59 degrees and then walked out onto black asphalt at 100 degrees. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, I, had a, uh, I was a tunnel mucker, dug a, ton, a storm sewer under the Milwaukee River at 100 feet below surface. I was a front-end brakeman for the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad. Uh, ben when Ben Heidemann was running it. So I had a wonderful cross sec. Oh, I worked in a landing cord and uh, dealt with explosives as we blew up <laughs> the, <laughs> the uh, landing out uh, west of Milwaukee. And I uh, worked for Ryan Construction on uh, uh, building a highway out of Waukesha. Uh, so I, I had a whole series of interesting jobs. And uh, I think that was uh, probably some of the fundamental uh, basic training that I, I received. Uh, and I got started in, in the computer business uh, quite uh, coincidentally. We don't got to get to that still. You're, you're still in childhood yet, oh. but, but a couple different questions for you. How did you meet Tasha? She walked past our house. Uh, she lived a block. She lived on State Avenue too, and she moved there when she was, uh, I think, in about tenth grade, and had a wonderful set of legs that uh, I came to admire her. I, I think she's listening. So, <laughs> <laughs> came to admire her early on, and uh, I knew her cousin, and uh, uh, that's how we. Um, uh, got acquainted and had a wonderful time in high school and uh, also in college. So what, uh, what lessons did you bring from your youth in Wauwatosa to Madison? What lessons? Uh, Family lessons? Well, number one, I think, uh, was the uh, to, to capitalize on opportunities, to whatever the situation was, whatever it, it presented. And uh, I ended in Madison in a very unusual way. There were four, uh, I was one of four siblings, and uh, the, our parents uh, uh, required that we go locally and live at home for the first two years. And being the youngest, my brother had experienced that. And uh, he was on his way up, I think it was his junior year. And he turned to me, this was after freshman week and said, uh, you'll hate it living at home, get your stuff. Uh, we'll work out a way that we both can be at Madison, which was <laughs> uh, a little surprising to my, uh, my good friend uh, Tasha, when I showed up on campus, because she had expected that I would be at home for two years. Um, but uh, moved into the fraternity house, of which I was not a member, and lived there for four years. And uh, uh, so that's kind of how I, I ended up. Uh, what were some of your first impressions of Madison? Well, we had been, uh, Wauwatosa was fortunate. We had been to Madison for the basketball tournaments. Uh, I think two out of the four years that I was in high school and stayed at the old Curtis Hotel, which has been converted right out of the Capitol, has been converted to, I think, a, an apartment uh, building now. And so I knew a little bit about Madison and my brother, uh, was uh, three years my senior, so he was in the process of getting his uh, uh, graduate, uh, undergraduate degree in geology, and then subsequently stayed on for two more years and, and got a master's. So 
uh, through him, uh, I, I knew it was a fun place to be, and I enjoyed being on the lake. Uh, you know, lakes are fundamental to the Wisconsin experience. And uh, uh, so uh, finding it there and living right on the lake, our, the fraternity house actually periodically was threatened when the ice went out and all the pledges had to go down and take axes and break up the ice so it wouldn't take out the pillars on the front of the house. So it was so good times. You, you had a career in technology, but you majored in business. Maybe you can explain. Well, it that. wasn't actually, it was commerce. And I also uh, spent some time in the law school my senior year to determine that I didn't want to be a lawyer. But uh, it was a rewarding experience. Uh, so how, how did you decide business? So you, you talked to me about how you ended up in business. I decided business based on uh, kind of uh, the, the job experiences that I had and the uniqueness of the structures and how what were the keys to, even at a very elementary level, what were the keys to success for you in that job? For instance, in, in, in title marking, uh, I didn't actually use the airspace that dug out the mark, but I loaded the push cart uh, that we pushed down the tunnel to the uh, shaft to take it out. And um, the uh, uh, number was the number of six inch wide uh, beams. And there were six of them that uh, you put built. And then what they did is they uh, put the concrete forms tied to those beams and blasted concrete in around them. Uh, I never went back in because, of course, it generates concrete, generates a lot of heat. I never went back in and took those out. I, I think that would be a hell of a job because there's a lot smaller space. But, but, but understanding how, how that model worked, uh, and uh, certainly in the, in the uh, in the cannery at a very fundamental level, uh, learning how that model, how they. Uh, stratified the uh, the peas, uh, and on uh, the big ones went in number ten cans, and we sold them to the military. Uh, and then the teeny weeny peas <laughs> went in smaller cans, and were a lot more expensive, of course, per ounce of peas. But just just that kind of uh, interest in in, in, in and. Uh, I subsequently went into sales, and of course, that kind of curiosity is fundamental to uh, successful, I believe, successful selling. So tell about your process when you uh, <clears throat> were getting ready to graduate. What type of companies were you looking at? How did you decide on your first well, I didn't. I didn't look at any companies because I went to grad school. And... Uh, Fortunately, I did not, I was rejected by Harvard and uh, enrolled at Stanford. And that was probably one of those uh, uh, incidents that really had a, a, a terrific impact on my subsequent life. Uh, I don't know what I would have done if I graduated from Harvard. I guess I would have gone in the military because I was an ROTC probably, uh, but it would have been a different. And you know, there are, there are kind of three different uh, 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 decision points in your life. Number one are those decisions that you make yourself. And that's a relatively limited number. Uh, might include, the, you know, a car, a house, a spouse. Uh, then there are decisions that are made for you by your parents, by your government. You know, the government decided <coughs> that I uh, had to register and that I had to go into the military. And that set me down a certain course. And while I was, in, and then there are those kind of uh, non specific, not focused events 
that impact your life. And in my case, the reason I ended up in the computer business was because uh, uh, Eisenhower, President Eisenhower did a strategic uh, uh, plan for the military <coughs> and converted from a tactical military to a strategic military under uh, Kurt LeMay, some people may remember it. And I was given two, uh, 24 hours to decide whether I was gonna stay in the military an additional uh, couple of years or, and fly or say no and fly a desk. And I ended up flying a desk and uh, because I had an MBA, they put me in the IBM department. And when I left the IBM department, the salesman said to me, took me to lunch and said, son, it's computers. And that's all I applied for. At that time, uh, IBM and the seven dwarfs. And I ended up with one of the dwarfs, uh, Honeywell. That was Honeywell. Uh, so what were you doing when you started with Honeywell? Uh, to start at Honeywell, well, uh, I taught coding, which was an odd selection because I really wasn't very good at it. And I taught COBOL, and I taught uh, Fortran, and I taught, uh, what was the name of their engineering? I can't remember now, uh, the engineering. And I did that for six months. <clears throat> and then they felt I was qualified to go into sales. So I got a territory uh, and uh, spent a lot of time. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been in sales, but uh, at that time, the, 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 the door to selling to companies was a window about yay big with a woman sitting on the inside smiling, hopefully, and uh, we went in and, had, and I'd say, uh, I want to speak to the head of the IBM department, which is kind of cutting because, I mean, they were the competitor. And I did that in Chicago, and uh, then I became branch manager in Milwaukee, or, and opened the office there, uh, and then went to, uh, to uh, California, opened, ran the office in San Francisco. For Honeywell. For Honeywell. And then you went to Stratus? Well, then uh, uh, I, I was passed over three times to be the general manager of a computer uh, organization for Honeywell. And I thought there was a message in that. Uh, and the message was that I was too short. All the guys that got the job were a lot taller than I was. And so I decided I had to make a change. And uh, I got an offer from a startup called Stratus Computer out in Framingham, Massachusetts, and never looked back. So how big was Stratus at the time? You said it was When I joined, it was about, uh, I think I was the 23rd employee, and other than one secretary, the only non-engineer. So it's, and <coughs> I can remember the <coughs> computer uh, the, at that point, they, uh, it was on a table about this big, and it had, uh, I don't know how many boards, half a dozen boards, and an oscillating fan <laughs> was going, and it was, they were in, uh, you know, you can take cardboard and cut slits in it, and you can put the board. That's what the computer was when I started. And, uh, so what brought you back to California? I got offered the job of president of a company. That was great. That was great. So how did that go? That was a uh, kind of... A that was the company that, uh, no matter what we did, or what, uh, it was a, a company where there was some kind of a catastrophe every day. And our product, the, the product idea was ahead of the times. 
because you try and take that amount, the, the amount of electronics at, at that point and stuff it in a 12 or 15 pound Let, let me pause for a second. Maybe people don't know that this is one of the first notebook, laptop, whatever right. you want to call it. Was it was one, one of the early ones. Yeah, so this is this was a It challenge. actually went to into space. The federal government bought uh, for the one of, I don't know, one of the Apollos, maybe, uh, and they used it for calculations. And what prompted you to shift from grid over to your next opportunity? Because the guy that, that was president of, uh oh, we sold the company. That's where I learned about cash flow. We had a, uh, the controller had an office about this big, maybe a little smaller. And every night, every, this is every night, we would meet in his office and with the uh, vice president of manufacturing, myself and the treasurer, and alphabetically arranged around all the, the wall were the invoices uh, for uh, materials that we needed with a check attached. And we would decide based, we'd call the bank, find out how much money was in the bank. And then we would, the manufacturing guy, we'd go around and select which invoices we would pay so we could stay open the next. Uh, you didn't have a lot of extra money. We never had extra money. You had no runway, as they would say. No too. runway. <laughs> no, no. We didn't even, uh, you know, there are two types of backlogs. There's the backlog that you uh, talk about publicly, and then there's the backlog you can actually ship. And in some companies, there's a, quite a difference between those two. And uh, we, we had a, uh, I learned a lot in, in that experience, both on how to stimulate uh, sales, how to keep them engaged, how to keep them uh, feeling positive about themselves. You know, we'd ship 25 laptops and I could guarantee that five of them would not work when they open. <laughs> and for the salesperson to say, oh, that's very unusual, <laughs> you know. About the fifth time you did that, you started thinking, well, is this really? <laughs> so we had wonderful trips. We had wonderful galas in Hawaii, Hong Kong, went to a lot of places in the world, had a good time. So somebody contacted you about an opportunity. It's a small company. They made some products that were probably not very uh well known in the market, but you uh, took a flyer. Well, that's it's a little different than that. Actually, uh, at Stratus, I I early on thought that the uh, fault tolerant computer would be an excellent uh, communications controller uh, as as a hub for communications, and uh, because. Our best markets were the uh, trading floors. Where we sold, we sold on up into all the big uh, uh, banks, trading banks, and uh, it would have, it probably would have been uh, a good entree point. The machine was too big ultimately for that function. But I had a real sensitivity that we were going to do a lot of connecting of. Uh, uh, disparaged equipment uh, and that someone was going to capture that market of bringing all of that, uh, uh, networking all of that together. And uh, I passed up a lot of opportunities when we, we actually sold uh, Grid to Tandy. Radio and, Shack. Radio Shack. Yeah. Which taught me something else and that is the guy that ran Radio Shack uh, turned out to have been the former uh, uh, computer manager, and he he thought that it would upgrade the image of the company to be actually a computer company, not just a parts company, but computers. And uh, we sold it. 
And he bought. It's one of your better sales jobs, right? Right. And uh, unfortunately, it didn't last too long, and they actually passed it off to someone else in L.A. Housing Rent. Okay. So anyway, you 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 have this idea that you think that disparate computers are going to be connected right. at some point, and I don't know how you got together with Don Valentine. A very strange. Uh, that was a result of a chap that worked for me who was contacted by a headhunter in uh, Marin, out of Marin, and he was in Boston. And he said, I don't, I'm not interested in moving, but why don't you contact this guy? He's out there. And this guy was down Yeah, and he's never, no, that was the headhunter. Okay. And uh, the headhunter actually, well, I, the headhunter had been hired by Cisco to do the search. And they were looking for what position? They were looking for uh, kind of a, a, a head of sales, service, and marketing. Okay. And I had had that job. Uh, that was the job I had at uh, Stratus. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, Valentine taught me something also. He, he, he liked the fact that my career had a progression. That, that the, jobs, the, the jobs I took one after another were, I don't know what you, they were better jobs. There were more responsible jobs. And he liked that pattern. Uh, and, uh, you know, founders, as we see today, uh, you, know, you can read about it in the Wall Street Journal, uh, founders of a lot of companies uh, uh, are successful because they're a bit quirky. And the founders at uh, Cisco were quite quirky, and so it was it was not just a management job in the sense of the functional areas. It was a management job in dealing with the founders uh, over, you know, and, and keeping, you know, uh, uh, venture capitalists invest in founders. They don't invest in guys that come in after the founder. That's not. And so there's a tension between the founders, the investor, and the guy that theoretically is supposed to run the company and grow the business. And certainly, you know. So when you found the company, you had some quirky founders, interesting technology, but you not only said that you were interested in coming in, but you also said that you were interested in investing. Yeah, I learned that at Stratus. Uh, because um, founders often think that the um, product that they've built sells itself. That if you go out and tell the story correctly, people will buy. In some cases, that may be true. In some other cases, uh, it may not be obvious to the, the buyer what all your advantages are. And uh, we had a vesting, a vesting model that's pretty standard, and that was that uh, you vested over four years at Cisco and uh, or at Stratus, and the first year, uh, you get nothing until you fill. And I joined Stratus in, uh, when the hell was it? My year was not up. And we had what we call Black Friday, where the president of the company, who was an engineer, <laughs> set a deadline. And I could have ended up walking out of there with nothing. And I decided I wasn't going to do that again. So at Cisco, I, I became, a, as a result of the success of Stratus, I 
had money that I could invest in, in, in the company. And now, Don Valentine, you we, we talked a little bit about this, and we talked about the fact that Milwaukee people are known to be quite frugal. Uh, my wife would tell you there's another word for it, but anyway, uh, I guess you were frugal, and that was one of the things that Don appreciated. I think Don liked that uh, along with it. And, and the other thing about it was that the founders had a, had, uh, a frugal uh, streak based on their backgrounds, which were, you know, quite humble backgrounds that they came up, I think, uh, the one I think did uh, may not have had a father or fruit, and the other lived with an aunt or something, and so they 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 had a definite. Uh, it would have been a conflict if, and uh, so I I. Uh, I arrived at the plant with a broken windshield for a number of years. <laughs> Tell some of the frugality stories, because I guess Cisco, you were famous for some of these stories. Oh, well, of course, the big argument you have with a sales organization and uh, support people is uh, the right to fly first class. And uh, <laughs> So we had that argument. I mean, here's a company that's uh, kind of like a bank in terms of the money that's coming in. Our, our uh, you know, we were a hardware company, but our gross margins were in the low 70s. So you're generating a ton of cash. And if you're growing, uh, you're not spending at that level. You know, the spending lags uh, that cash flow. And so there were a lot of arguments inter internally about why couldn't they. When we went international, we went very early because I, I knew, based on my uh, uh, strategy experience, that if you want to sell the big companies, you've got to be worldwide. And so we very early on at Cisco went to Europe and subsequently to Asia, Japan. And so there is a lot of you know, a lot of travel. And, um, but here, my size was an advantage, you know. I can be almost comfortable in coach, or at least look that way. And uh, so we had a lot of debates. And <clears throat> so I created, <laughs> at the sales meeting, I created a, a virtual first class, which, uh, and I had to, I took videos uh, I flew to Europe on Pan Am first class and took videos of the shrimp <laughs> and, and the chilled uh, uh, vodka. You know, they used to put it in a, a, a block of ice. And uh, <laughs> so I took these periods of sleeping. <laughs> and uh, it was at the age, uh, just coincidentally at the time, they were they were featuring this idea of visualizing a tennis stroke or a golf. Remember that? Yes, yes. You know, you got to see yourself. And so my my idea was that you would visualize first class, first class. <laughs> and I demonstrated it. At, uh, you know, uh, and we had a motto uh, that was uh, we'll always try and up your, upgrade you to the aisle. <laughs> and we had little, you know, uh, in first class, they always gave out a little. We had those with life shades and so on, earplugs, so you could visualize, really get into it. Didn't you tell me one of your employees uh, kind of? Oh, well, <laughs> so shortly after the sales meeting, we always had our sales meeting, unlike, uh, unlike, uh, 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 Stratus, where we had, or I'm sorry, unlike Grid, where the product was tough to sell, we had very, very nice sales meetings with husband and wife and Hawaii and Hong Kong and that sort of thing. Uh, our product, at least, and I wasn't the engineer that designed it, was easy to sell. 
And so <clears throat> we had all of our sales meetings in San Jose <laughs> in the summer. Okay. Well, you can get good cheap rooms then. And uh, so I was introducing virtual first class and subsequently flew to Minneapolis and I was sitting in coach fortunately. And uh, the stewardess came back with one of those little cards that said, uh, uh, Northwest Airlines would like to upgrade you to virtual first class. <laughs> Some smart ass. Salesman up in front, front of me, probably in first class. <laughs> I don't know. Well, you uh, retired. Well, talking, going back a little bit, and one of the questions we talked about was, um, you know, all of a sudden, you know, guy from middle class background in Milwaukee uh, ends up Cisco goes IPO. How did your life change? How did I? Well, uh, I, I don't know that at a fundamental level, it train changed all that much. Uh, we have two uh, luxuries. One is we have a second home, not a third, not a fourth, not a fifth, as seems to me currently in vogue, but we have a second home uh, and we have an airplane. And the airplane, I don't know, have you ever traveled to Madison? You know, you can't travel directly to Madison. You travel to somewhere else first. You know, you travel to Minneapolis or, God help you if you go to Chicago, but maybe St. Louis. Uh, I, I don't think we could have been involved at the level that we've been involved. Now, I have an interesting story, and correct me if I'm wrong, but a couple of years ago, Wisconsin was playing one of the uh, NCAA basketball tournament games, and you happened to be speaking, I think, in front of the computer science or the engineering group, and you said, does anybody need a ride to the game? Oh, yeah. And I think a couple of people went. Yes. They met you at the airport, and you took them down to so, L.A. I can't remember. Yeah, L.A. I saw so yeah. yeah, so it was kind of fun. So... You retired in 2006. How was that transition? What did you do? How did you transition? Actually, it didn't. Uh, well, actually, I retired as president in 90, no, yeah, 1990, what, I can't remember. Eight or six. Like yeah, seven, seven or something like that. Uh, and then I was chairman. And uh, so I, I, I had always wanted to, well, two, I would say there are a couple of things that happened. Number one, uh, a key to those people doing startups, you know, it's not always what you contribute, it's when you arrive on the scene that's most important. And the earlier you arrive, if the company is successful, and that's a big if, uh, you are disproportionately rewarded if you hang on to the stock. You know, <clears throat> some of our engineers went out and bought uh, Ferraris, and I used to, uh, you know, they'd buy it one year, and the next year I'd say, Well, what's your Ferrari worth today? <laughs> you know, it's gone up in price, it's doubled maybe. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so, I got a lot of stock and I bought stock as an investor. And so we ended up with a lot of money. And I would, I would say that changed our life in that, uh, in some ways, but uh, mostly in our, our giving. That's what I was going to say. So you shifted at least when you left right. Cisco to being, you know, as we discussed before, philanthropist. Yeah, but you know, uh, a lot of a lot of the experiences we had were not directly the result of money. Uh, I was involved at CARE and traveled the world with them. And there's no better way to see the world than with some kind of a third party, not as a tourist, 
but as uh, in a different role. Uh, I traveled the world with Ben's business executives for national security. Yeah, you had to have some money to keep the, the you know, donate and support those. I was chair of the uh, Nature Conservancy, traveled the world, went to New Guinea and places. I would never, uh, uh, you know, have gone as purely a tourist. And uh, so there is some money involved there, but it's not, it's not at a magnitude. It's your decision personally that you want to, uh, well, number one, that you have something to contribute. And number two, that you have a, a kind of a, a, a passion for uh, that undertaking. And uh, uh, so, as I said, uh, the second home and the airplane were the big, were probably the major changes. Uh, we've had our house since 1990 something. So Wisconsin happened to be one of your passions, and it seems Wisconsin, like Wisconsin is one of the passions. You know, it's a unique school in the fact uh, not only what you learn, but that it's it's a wonderful community to be a part of. And uh, what is it about Badgers? Because we we all I, I tell you know, a lot of uh, stories you, about. Well, you know, I I don't know that I think we think it's unique. I don't know that it's all that unique. I mean, if you've ever been to the Rag Bride, riding across Iowa on a bicycle, it's it's got a lot of the same kind of energy and adventure and camaraderie uh, and there are a lot of there are a lot of situations like that that you can uh, be part of it we we were in Denver for Thanksgiving and did the turkey trot and there are you know 8,000 people little kids dogs uh, <laughs> it, it, it exists in a lot of different forms in a lot of different places but I would say that, that uh, you know, I have a, a good friend. Actually, it was a company we tried to buy in virtual. And uh, he went to Harvard. <laughs> and he said, you know, I wear my Harvard shirt. And, and no one ever says anything. He said, but you damn badgers. He said, you know, you have, hey, badger. You know? All over the world. All over the world. I was in Milwaukee last week, and you see it all the time, and you have to hold yourself back, back. and say, there's a lot of them around here. Right. So I think what, what I'd like to do is I'd like to kind of open up to some questions. and then, Well, oh, we, we should cover one other thing. Okay. And then why should we build this damn building? Yeah, go ahead. You know, I uh, the building, it... it uh, uh, what I've come to realize is that space, the space you exist in, is relevant. And it gives us, it, it, it has flavors that you respond to. Uh, and I guess the best example on the Madison campus for me is uh, the School of Education and the redo of that building and specifically the redo of the back half of the building uh, and the kind of atmosphere and environment that that creates. Now, everyone won't, may not want to, it, it's a shh place. I mean, when we designed it, we thought it would be an open, but it's a shh place. <laughs> yeah. so tell you, me, you're, now, the three buildings that you've been involved with, all of them had this interesting design concept. You have education, Wisconsin Institute of Discovery, and now the new CDS, CDS building. Was this your feeling based on something you had? Was this, you know, all the experts, the consultants who came in? What, how, did, how did all these, you know, community thinking spaces get created? Who had that concept? Oh, I think, I don't think it's so, uh, you know, all kinds of structures are going through that kind of reevaluation now. And it'll reevaluate again as a result of the pandemic. And uh, what it looks like coming out of that. 
Uh, the only thing that I would say is that I think that spate uh, uh, structure is important. Uh, have you been in the computer science tower? Uh, you mean the old one? The old one. Yes. I mean, what kind of reaction do you have to that? Well, that was kind of the 1960s building, right? Reminds me, have you ever been to Russia? Uh, I haven't. I've been to Eastern Europe, but not Russia. Where they have the tall buildings with a lot of concrete? Yep. And it, we've been long overdue. In yeah, long overdue. Yeah. That, that is correct. I mean, it, it's not kind of the kind of space where your your mind expands you know but it does so many things because you know it helps recruitment you get bright students you get people you know you put up a new uh, sports training facility and and all of a sudden you can recruit better and i'm sure the same thing is going to happen and we're looking for the best and brightest in wisconsin and so a facility like this is going to be important um well and you know, there's an added value in the sense that at that institution, you're not starting at ground zero. Mm -hmm. You know, they had, they had, they, they took in over 8,000 freshmen from every state in the United States. I think every county in Wisconsin, maybe the like two or three or one, I can't, can't remember. Uh, it's a vibrant environment and uh, a, the right kind of structure leverages off of that enthusiasm and space. And that's why the building and its design is important. It is important. Well, let's ask a couple questions okay. because there might be some good questions. Benny, uh, we'll kind of let you take on the questions. Absolutely. Are you still awake, Benny? Wide awake. <laughs> and I hope I'll be only audio because I really do want to focus on the answers here. Um, our first question, what do you think is the most important thing a college student can do to benefit their future? Ah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh. I think one of the challenges is uh, what's the right balance in terms of uh, and uh, what the balance is is a function of the, the the particular situation at the time. For instance, when uh, when I became president of uh, Cisco. I always, and we had what, uh, I don't know. I, well, I was number something, 34, 39. Or the most important thing for me then was to be the first one in the office in the morning and to make coffee because it sets, it sets a, so, so what I'm saying is that the, the situation, particular situation you're involved in at the time dictates to some degree where you ought to put your efforts. And those efforts change depending upon what that situation may be and what your, you know, what your relationships are. <coughs> and so I, I uh, but I, I would say the, the, the uh, it took me a long time, for instance, to learn that a good partnership with your spouse works best when she says, uh, would you, before she even tells you what it is, you say, yes, I will. And more importantly, you do it then. You don't say, I'm going to do it tomorrow or next week or a month from now. Uh, so situationally, and it took me a long time to learn that, and in certain parts of my life, uh, that wasn't the key thing. I didn't say yes, you know, when I was uh, trying to get Cisco to breathe life into 
and get that capitalized on uh, that opportunity. And it was different at uh, at Stratus, where I'd come into the office with 25 engineers, and I was the only one non-engineer in the place. And uh, the product was sitting on a table. I was head of sales, marketing. I mean, how do you market? <laughs> Five boards stuffed in concrete or in the cardboard with a fan oscillating up. <laughs> well, you can't do that. We sold General Electric got it. <laughs> but so I think it, 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 it's a variable. It's a variable. And the key is your sensitivity to what the variables are in the situation I'm currently involved in. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Um, from Roshan, is a business degree or an MBA necessary to be an entrepreneur or tech leader? What do you think? I don't think so. Uh, you know, one of the beauties, one of the beauties of Silicon Valley and one of the challenges in Madison, Wisconsin, is in Silicon Valley, you can hire or you can rent uh, whatever capability you want. You know, one, one of the beauties of in, in the era that I was here uh, was that you could get a prototype done in uh, a couple of weeks because there was that capability out there. You didn't have to do it. You could cut a, a, a do a board. Uh, and now I suppose you don't even have to do that. You simulated the software. So I think I think the the key is to recognize what you're capable of handling and making sure you, uh, that you uh, that you augment that with the places you aren't. You know, one thing I learned at uh, Wauwatosa High School. Uh, I was on the swimming team, and the swimming team went to the state, won the state tournament two years in a row. Both both years, I was on the team. Won the suburban conference two years in a row. I was on the team. Won the cardinal relays two years in a row. I was on the team. I was not the best guy on the team. So, but I had a, I I was a, I had teammates. That augmented my limited capability, and I think that that's true in in you know in uh, any business is to find those kinds of uh, uh, added capabilities, recognizing what you you lack, not thinking you can do it all. Absolutely awesome. So, and I know there's a question about the computer science program, and we're going to come right back to it. I want to focus on the story with John. Um, we're also at time, but I want to, we do have a few more questions. And if people hang out with us, um, I even have Build Me Up Buttercup queued to play us out. Um, but we do have a few more questions. So I know we're at time, but please hang with us. Um, our next question is, is to the panelists a piece of advice. Um, if you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice, what would you say? I should have run for governor of the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only, only, only thing I would have liked to have done in my life. And I, I had the, I had the uh, positioning. I didn't have the opportunities necessarily. Uh, and I would have had to have customized myself again to uh, three dark months of cold. But uh, I think I would have been a good governor, and I would have liked to have done it. <laughs> yes, I would have voted for you. <laughs> um, so, and, and this one's from Adam. Um, the community piece that you talked about at the end. Do you have any advice or a story about how to build that feeling of community and teamwork 
with your own company, um, especially from starting out? Yeah, you know, the first thing, the, uh, when I went to, uh, what? When I went to uh, uh, Cisco, uh, one of the first things we did, and I, actually I did this, <laughs> I did this at uh, Stratus also. Uh, one of the first thing we we had a, a, a kickoff meeting for the year, which I think is important to kind of reset the goals, get everyone on board. We actually had it uh, at uh, Stanford, and we had uh, members of the Stanford band, and we had the tree. Uh, and it it kind of it kind of uh, sets a, a feeling of community right from the get go, and so it's those I think those events are important. Uh, I also think, and uh, you know, uh, Friedman probably disagree with me. Uh, the stockholder is not the only important person in the room. Uh, I'm a believer that there are a lot of constituencies that are important to a business and to up to 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 the community and the country and so on, and that you should be sensitive to those and you should be part of those. Uh, you know, we we did a food drive, and they've done it ever since I think, and they win it most years. And so those kinds of things, uh, uh, we had pick, we end up we had picnics. Uh, they aren't expensive, and they don't take a lot of time, and they they change the atmosphere. They, they you know they change the atmosphere of the place. Absolutely, awesome. All right. Uh, and this question is from Craig, um, and then we're going to bring back up everybody to talk about uh, questions from CS and everything, um, and get through the rest of our questions. But Craig asks, "What are your thoughts about quantum computing? Is it a pipe dream or is it real? Uh, if real, when do you think it will be applied applied broadly?" Way above my pay grade, <laughs> you know. Remember Don't Jesse? ask an old man what the future is going to be. He knows a lot about the past, and he tends to think in the terms of the past. I don't know. I I, I can't give you a good answer. Tom um, or Ramsey, like, uh, if you don't mind, introduce yourself to everybody that here that doesn't know who you are. <laughs> well, that's great. Well. Thank you, Benny. It's a real privilege and honor to, to be here with you. And I'm, I'm really proud to be a Badger when I see the young Badgers like yourself uh, taking the stage. So thank you very much. Uh, my name is Tom Erickson. I'm a, actually a third generation Badger myself. I grew up in Wisconsin, but uh, graduated in the last millennium and actually became an entrepreneur. So that's my background. I spent 40 years as an entrepreneur before I being called to my alma mater to uh, really help found together with Ramsey. Um, we've created, a, I think, really a special partnership uh, to create this school of computer data information sciences, which has a special vision that we're excited to share with you later. And one where entrepreneurship is front and center to the whole um, mission. So with that, uh, I'll let Ramsey introduce himself. Oh, sure. And thanks, uh, Tom. And thanks, uh, Benny. A great intro. And, uh, you know, I think, Anyone who's involved with the university, uh, um, one of the prime motivators are seeing you know young people like yourself and, and the energy and enthusiasm you bring to uh, what you're doing, um, and it just it kind of uh, you know makes us all feel younger and, and more energized to go forth and do things. So uh, by the way, which is 100% been what it's been like to be on campus again, right? Being on campus, uh, as people may know, some maybe some of the attendees don't. Uh, you know, we've been in person, and and that's just been really. Uh, you know, energizing to to be connected again in in a less virtual way than than, than this event, I guess. Um, so anyway, um, my name is Ramsey Arpachi Duso. I'm uh, been a professor here for 21 years, and uh, I am uh, currently the chair of the computer sciences department. Um, I work in 
computer systems broadly. So the, you know, like operating systems and, um, you know, distributed systems, storage systems, that sort of stuff sort of thing and that's where we spend our research part of our mind and that's where what kind of topics we teach to students and it's been really a, a pleasure to to work with tom and, and really many others over many years on on the creation of this new school here on campus it's a historic event for campus to to recognize the importance of computing and and data and also to really the connection of those formerly kind of almost niche technologies to understanding that they're really affecting everybody uh, in everything that we do and so i think the campus has recognized that and that's why they, we've made this structural change and really what will that will help with is of course you know pushing forward research for many years and in, in, in all these directions of, of technological directions but also really helping educate a broad group of students not just our majors but many many people who have to become much more technologically savvy than they used to in order to really uh, you know be effective in the modern world so I think a real opportunity for us to not only do the deep research that we've always been doing, but really a, a broader educational mission that we've ever had. So uh, exciting time and I'm, I'm really excited to be here and, and, and thanks for all the work to get this together. Absolutely. Awesome. But I just, as our, our host Dave and John get set up, I actually think it might make sense um, just if we might start with the presentation. Um, so I know we have a really cool presentation about everything we're talking about here. So I think we'll, we'll actually kind of get started with that. And Let's then that. we'll move to our fireside talk with, with our host, yeah. Dave, and with John Morgridge afterwards. But but this is thrilled. I'm really excited for this. So with that being said, um, yeah. Tom, I'll pass the torch off to you. Thanks. And let's dive in. All right. Well, let's do that. Before I introduce, I'm going to introduce us with a little video. But I just want to talk a little bit about how we got this started. It was uh, just a few years ago, CS had become the largest major on campus. It was growing at over 30% per year in terms of number of students. It's gone crazy, a 10x growth in 10 years. And uh, that creates a challenge for universities. It's not used to that kind of growth. And so uh, we created a committee and uh, that committee worked on the future of CS. And Ramsey was part of that. I was part of that and a number of other great, great individuals. And the recommendation from that committee was to create this school and that's how we got here. Um, and with that, I'm gonna share just a, just a little video and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it. It talks a little bit about um, um, who we are. So here we go. It's subtle the way things are changing. The seeds once imagined decades ago now show up in our daily lives. It's here, the future, and none of us can expect to face it alone. Alone isn't where ideas thrive. That's why UW-Madison created the School of Computer, Data, and Information Sciences. Connecting ideas, connecting data, connecting people, who will work at the intersection of technology and humanity to solve society's greatest challenges. UW-Madison will be where the now and the next converge. It's a first-of-its-kind collaboration in the nation, lighting the way forward for research and discovery across campus. A cutting-edge building where the best and brightest will be drawn to collaborate, completing a tech corridor at the center of campus magnifying the power of medicine, engineering, agriculture, and business, an economic engine for the state, where ideas converge to form a foundation for the future of science and industry. It's the Wisconsin Idea 2.0. Not only will the influence of the university work to the benefit of the people of the state, but this new collaboration will make every idea better. When we connect, the future begins. CETUS, the convergence of what's next. Well, cool. I, I hope everyone enjoyed that. Um, we're going to transition now over to uh, just a little bit of presentation. But as I do that, Ramsey, maybe you can kick us off and tell us a little bit about some of the, the constituents. You know, we've taken these top ranked uh, departments, put them together. Talk about what we've done while I bring up this, uh, the next part of the slide. So. 
Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, when we were on this task force that Tom mentioned, um, our challenge was to really figure out what is the future of computing and data on, on campus. And, and really what that ended up meaning is, well, who's gonna be part of whatever this new school is that we were thinking about and how can we use that to drive our mission forward? Um, so, you know, in the computer sciences department, and obviously that was uh, a natural, uh, a natural starting point. But we were seeing connect connections and, and deeper and deeper connections into a bunch of um, a bunch of other areas where we felt like there could be some really strong partners on campus. So, also part of the new school, the School of Computing, Data, Information Sciences, is the Department of Statistics. Uh, department of Statistics is. Uh, you know, an old department is a top ranked department, has some great history, has some great people right now, of course. And, and increasingly what we were seeing in, is that computer science department and statistics department, we're starting to interview some similar kind of faculty. And where, why that is, is because the connection of computing and data is happening right between us, uh, especially in areas like machine learning, which is transforming so much of what we do out there. And, and so one, partner in this endeavor is, is the Department of Statistics, and we're excited that, that they're a part of it. And that really connects computing and data in a, in a deep way and in a way that's pretty unique across the country and in the world, actually. Um, the other part of it, which we'll talk about in a second as well, is the uh, what you is called here on campus, it's a department also, it's called the iSchool or the Information School. And there we were seeing a connection, say, between computer science and what we were what we were connecting to, which is the, the human side of computing. So, um, for example, in technical areas like human computer interaction, studies of usability, and studies really of things like the impact of technology on, on humans. And so the iSchool is also part of our, our new school. So it's a school within a school. Um, and, and it's really connecting what we're doing with computing and data to, to humans and society, which is of course pretty critical uh, in the modern age. So I think those are our three core departments and uh, that's where we are. So I guess we'll just lead right into these, <laughs> these slides. Um, you know, the, the computing part is pretty easy to see if anybody's been paying attention for the last so many decades. Uh, you know, one thing we say often in the computing world that's from Mark Andreessen is that software is eating the world. Um, really meaning that computing is just and software and skill in software is, is transforming how we do everything. Um, that's from, you know, that's happened in the advertising world with so much of what, you know, Google and, and others do. Uh, it's happened in, in how we deliver entertainment. It's how we do communication now, like this platforms right now. These are all just software platforms, right? It's amazing. And it's not surprising that many of the large, the largest companies in the world are software companies, right? Years ago, it was oil companies. Like when I was growing up, oil companies were the biggest company. Now it's all software companies. Um, that's also been reflected in, um, in the, um, and by the way, when are we going to do questions? I'm happy to do them live or we can do them uh, at the end. Benny, do you have an idea? Either like work, however you want to do it. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, I don't know, Tom, I feel like we'll just answer them as we go, if that's okay. Does that sound Yeah, let's, let's do that. Sure. Yeah. So the, the question from uh, um, Adam is uh, when, you know, when we're developing curriculum, what consideration are we make, giving to ethics and ethical practice as a, you know, a core tenant, which is a fantastic question. Um, this came up very recently. Uh, I was involved, as were many people on campus, with the creation of a new major, data science. Um, so on the right, actually, the graph that's shown in the, in the slides here, uh, that's a sh showing how fast our CS and computer science major has grown from 200 people about a decade ago to over 2,000 now, fastest, biggest major on campus. But the biggest growing major on campus is actually a new major we just introduced, which is the data science major. And as, when, I, when, we were, when I was part of that, um, we really made it about three pillars. The first was, you know, um, not, not in any order, but of course I'll say computing is one pillar because that's where I come from. So to, to be good in data science, this new space where you have to be able to deal with large amounts of data and get towards decisions like in a business or to your science, and if that's what you do, um, you have to have some computing facility and some programming facility. So there's a computing pillar in our data science major. 
there's also a statistical pillar because we have to have a deep understanding of the data that we uh, you can't do, you know doing bad doing messing with data but not knowing what you're doing that it gives worse is worse sometimes than not having any data at all so you have to have statistical understanding and so the statistics department has a pillar in there too but the third pillar which we said should be a core part of the program from day one is a, a pillar of ethics. So there's an ethics pillar in the iSchool. Uh, it helps, uh, it teaches that side of it to all data science majors, right? It's a core requirement. Um, we're also in the computer science department. We've been developing an ethics course. We just taught it for the first, we're a little bit late to it because years ago when CS developed, I would say that it wasn't a, of course, we've always wanted people to be ethical, but we, the impact of CS wasn't nearly as large. So we're, we're now also, uh, have been have created such a course and are figuring out how to teach it at scale. Of course, we have to be able to teach it to 2,000 people and also trying to layer it into our other courses where it's appropriate. So it's absolutely a core curricular idea right now. Everything that's new that's being created is including it from the ground up. And then we're kind of adding it on to the places where it wasn't before. So thanks for that question. So in any case, um, you know, computing has been transforming the world. Um, computing and data are, are really transforming everything too. Science on campus, um, as well as you know, many businesses and anything in the world. Uh, the quote I often use, it's not machines will replace chemists, it's that chemists who use machines will replace chemists who don't. It's just becoming a core thing that you have to be able to do is to be able to do deep science with, with data and computing. Um, if you look at some of the most revolutionary things that people have discovered, like uh, if you know in biology, CRISPR is transforming how we do gene editing. You know, deep in the story of CRISPR, there's a data science piece where people recognized certain patterns in DNA and, and eventually figured out, you know, what that those those patterns meant and could that we could harness them to edit DNA in a very powerful way, which is certainly going to transform the world as well. And then finally, that what I also hinted at was that computing and data are really perfecting, you know, eating society. And we can't be simply this can't be something we ignore anymore. We 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 are creating very powerful technologies. And I think every field goes through this, right? There's a, uh, you know, in chemistry years ago, chemistry was all positive and everything was good. And then people discovered TNT and has a dangerous with it. Uh, physics had an era of this, right? The phys physicists figured out some amazing things about the nature of the universe, but that also included figuring out how an atom bomb could be constructed. And we're in a stage in the world where computing and data are as powerful as ever and we have to be quite cognizant of that as we create these powerful tools that we also understand that how to wield them for good. So those trends are kind of what drove us to create this new school, computing data and its impact on people. Um, maybe we could skip to the next slide. Yeah, so that's the vision really behind the School of Computer Data Information Science or CETAS. Um, really working at the intersection of technology and humanity to work on our, you know, our biggest challenges. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's these three core departments. And of course, we'll be working deeply in our own field together and within our departments across those barriers, but also, of course, with everybody else on campus. Uh, what we're doing is we're bringing all of these groups together into, into one unit so we can really just magnify what we're doing in computing and data and its impact on people. And I think there's many examples that we'll, we'll get to over the next years and, and how we connect to the med school and engineering and agriculture and business. And we're already doing a bunch of those things, uh, which I'm sure maybe we'll talk about in a given time. So it really a, a exciting time on campus, a unique time. There'll be, it's like a one-time thing that you get to do is create uh, a new school and a new school with such central importance. It's also unique in that not many campuses have yet been able to do this for lots of reasons that are sometimes bureaucratic, sometimes uh, you know other reasons, but somehow here at Wisconsin, we've been able to bring these core units together and form a school that's really poised to you know, set us up for the, for the next century, I think, uh, of, of advancing computing and data and its impact on the world. Here we go to the next uh, slide, maybe. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks, Ramsey, and, and uh, this is not just a coincidence that this is a picture of our guest, uh, our future guest tonight, but uh, you know, as a part of our strategy for our new school, we're, we're working on our research, um, adding new faculty uh, by leaps and bounds, actually. Uh, secondly, we're 
introducing a lot of curriculum. Ramsey talked about a new data science major. We, we've also added a data science certificate or minor. This year, we've added a master's in information science. Next year, we'll be adding a master's in data science, a master's in data engineering, and an undergraduate major in information sciences. Um, so lots of things going on in curriculum. We're doing a lot more in the areas of entrepreneurship. Today, we had a creative destruction lab um, session. Tomorrow, we have another one in risk. Today was health and wellness. Um, of course, uh, many of you may know about already the Margaret um, boot camp in the summers around entrepreneurship. So we're doing a lot more in entrepreneurship. But one of the other things we're doing is pulling everybody together and putting together a new building. And uh, this is a very large building. Uh, it'll uh, not only house CDIS, it will also house the Data Science Institute on campus, the Center for High Throughput Computing, and some of our brethren from the School of Medicine and Public Health in the area of biostatistics and medical informatics. So it's, um, we believe it's gonna be a lighthouse for the state, a lighthouse in technology. We see um, you know, in areas of economic development uh, across the country, technology, academia coming, sorry, industry, academia coming together, government playing a part. And we believe Madison and Wisconsin is just ripe for this to happen. Recently, Madison was named the number one place in the country by LinkedIn for tech job growth during the pandemic. Just prior to that, the Brookings Institution said was, uh, Madison is the number one place in the country as a potential for a new innovation hub. And uh, with that, we think that this new building in our school can play a very big and important part. And we're extremely grateful to the mortgages, both John and Tasha, for their generosity in, um, in funding our building. Uh, we're well on our way. Um, we have uh, uh, actually much more than 125 million secured. This is a little bit out of date. It's closer to 140 million secured plus a $50 million matching gift. And uh, we're of course going to be asking people here to participate in that. Um, this is um, a rendering of the new building. This is a fresh, just off the press today. This will show what it's like coming into our lobby and an opportunity to go up into the building. We want people to, to go up and experience the building and, and understand what it's uh, going to be like. Um, if you're on the second floor or a second level, uh, this is a level where students uh, can congregate and, uh, and get together, um, go to advising, go to open studies. Uh, coming up from the ground floor, uh, yet you can still move up into the parts of research. And as you get up to uh, the seventh floor, the top of the building, we'll be having a terrace where you can go out and look over Camp Randall and Union South and the engineering campus and, uh, and gather up there and uh, enjoy uh, the views from up there. This is an external view of the building, um, looking from the corner of Charter and University, which is um, Kind of where Sterling Hall is, if you want to think of that, or Chamberlain Hall, um, and looking down past the Discovery Building, which is just past us uh, on there. So uh, a different angle of the building. Uh, again, this one from the corner of Orchard, as if we're standing across from the Discovery Building, uh, looking at to give an idea of, of uh, what the CDIS building is going to look like. And here you can see the placement uh, between University and Johnson, between Charter and Orchard. Brogdon Psychology Building is the other building on the block. We'll be taking down a couple of existing uh, old uh, facility building to put up this brand new structure. Um, the structure is unique, just like the school is, in that we're going to be putting together people in the research ecosystem and blending them and mixing them. So we'll have a floor for data science. We'll have a floor where there's people studying human computer interaction and you won't necessarily know, you know, I'm on this floor, is someone part of computer sciences? Are they part of bio, uh, BMI, the biostatistics department, uh, statistics, the high school, these different things that come together, that's in the research tower. And on the lower levels, uh, below ground and level one is where we'll have our classrooms. This is really important to us and Ramsey's been an amazing champion for this because currently today, very few of any of the classes taught in either statistics or computer science are actually taught in those buildings. 
And so the students, especially first, second year students, probably don't get a chance to spend time in the building affiliated with their major or with the classes that they're taking. Um, we'll get to also a, an entire learning ecosystem, introducing new concepts in a learning center, learning commons, developing the notion of what a modern library is, and then going up into the research tower and up to the top floor. There's lots of opportunities for people to contribute, more than 200 spaces that can be named and recognized, and plus a recognition wall. So there's a lot of opportunities for people to invest in CDIS. Uh, this is some of the things that um, we'd love to share with you and think about. Um, and uh, with that, I am going to uh, turn it over. Um, do we have another question, Rimsey? There's or a couple of questions. Um, one is uh, what types of technology will be in the building for students? Do you want to take that? You want me to? Um, well, either way, uh, I mean, I think uh, I think there's a lot of answers to that, right? Yeah. There's a curricular technology, right, which is one one side of it. Um, there, that the uh, you know the modern classroom is going to have a kind of a ability to expose people to things in, in new ways. Uh, but I think probably the question is more like, what kind of things are they going to be able to play with and where? Um, so I don't know if you want to talk about like the the CS Tech Hub and or yeah. Like so we've got this notion of a breadcrumb trail throughout the building and every floor in the research tower has a notion of a, a theme that associates with it. Starting with level three, uh, level three has a, uh, sorry, level two. Level two actually will have a, a checkout area where you could check out a Raspberry Pi or Arduino or different things if you want to do it yourself. And so there's an opportunity, you know, today's modern CS library is actually about devices sometimes. Um, but moving up, and you can do all of this on the internal stairwell, going up to the CS Tech Hub, where we expect to see all kinds of things happening from edge computing demonstrations with lots of sensors and uh, things uh, along those lines into building automation, plus, of course, robots and other types of devices that we're doing, together with some of the uh, software-based research that we'll do. And those areas will be accessible and viewable to the public. Um, and uh, also in those areas, uh, we'll be mixing in uh, graduate student uh, facilities that, uh, so students that come in will have the chance to work together and collaborate. Moving up into the fourth floor, we'll find uh, an opportunity on the fourth floor for a, our HCI hub human computer interaction and user experience. We have a special area for interviewing people and, and uh, taking um, studies of uh, things along human computer interaction. Moving into the fifth floor, it's our data science floor. We'll have a visualization studio, plus lots of opportunities to uh, take a look and understand what data science is doing. So the visualization studio is gonna be very cool in the way that we allow ourselves to visualize the data and, and understand what's going on. And the sixth floor, we, we call it a new hub. Uh, we haven't actually defined the theme yet. Uh, it's a relatively new floor for us, and we're kind of leaving that open. And on the seventh floor, uh, what is very cool about the seventh floor is we'll have a 160 person seminar hub, which will be a great place for guest speaking, both for faculty guest speakers, but uh, as well, people from the outside. And we're hoping to host a lot of entrepreneurship activities in the building. Uh, we're having an entrepreneurship uh, center on the level two, but even on the seventh floor, we'll have a space for presentations and accommodating people in entrepreneurship or other uh, types of uh, presentations. So yeah, Rimsey, did I miss some things there? No, that's great. And um, this one's from Roger. Um, talks about NLP, natural language processing, um, specifically about a course at UW, CS545. Um, really, his question is, what are the department's plan for NLP generally? And if there is any plan to at least start offering this, what do you think? Yeah. And this might be a course to us. Yeah. Maybe I should answer that one. Um, so yeah, NLP is important, like many areas of computer science, and um, we're actively 
the campus actually is actively <laughs> trying to hire people in this space. It is pretty competitive. Uh, we were fortunate last year to hire um, a faculty member, not in CS, but in a, one of our peer departments, uh, biostatistics and medical informatics. And, and so as a result of that, we'll be starting to see some of those classes again. And I suspect uh, CS will be, you know, last year we tried to hire some people, they, they went elsewhere because it's a competitive market. But yeah, sure, it's an important area. And um, I don't know if it's the most important area as the question kind of indicates, but it's, it's an important area like many areas related to machine learning and deep learning. And we've been building a lot of strength around um, machine learning generally. So in the last few years, we've hired in computer vision, uh, hired in deep learning, which is really the engine driving everything, hired in statistical machine learning, um, hired in um, you know, other forms of machine learning. So all the core areas around um, that are, are have been bolstered quite a bit just in the last five, five, seven years. And NLP is, is will be part of that and, and we'll be able to actually more easily build an NLP uh, because of the other strength we've been building. So yes, absolutely. Hey, Ramsey, there was a question I, I answered part of, but I didn't answer the other part, which was uh, dealing with executive master's programs. We have professional master's programs I assume by executive master's programs, I mean for part-time programs for people. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about our thinking on our master's programs? Yeah, I think um, you know a lot of opportunity um, exists in that space, and and you know of course while much of what we're doing is is focused on you know we have a, a research mission that's front and center that we're always trying to increase our excellence and depth and CS and related areas um, you know, education we have many educational opportunities in front of us at many levels so we've created we have a professional degree in in the in a master's in the CS department we also have a professional certificate where people who are a little bit less versed in CS can can gain a foothold and, and kind of prepare to then get a master's it's almost like a second major late in the game um, we are developing a professional master's in data science and, and that'll be, I think, a really fantastic degree. Uh, and we're also working with the B School to, um, in, in the space of creating a, a professional, a kind of a tech MBA. So where you would come in and not only get an MBA, but also get a, um, some CS expertise in the form of a, of a certain form of a CS master's. And I think uh, that will be a particularly useful in this burgeoning space of product management where where people have to be able to be not only leaders on the on the business side, but also be able to understand technical products, software products uh, deeply enough so as to be able to lead teams that drive forward innovation inside of companies is also in, in, in venture. So a huge number of things going on in that space uh, that I think we'll be we'll be doing over the, the next so many years. Wow. All right. And we've got four questions left. So thank you so much. Um, I, I'm going to just pause for a second, Benny. Uh, Roy, who's letting us use this office, said that the lights are going to go off in about 10 minutes, so. <laughs> All righty. Well, we, <laughs> we got one more, and then we'll, we'll play us out. <laughs> How about that? Um, and, and thank you for letting us use the space. All right. Um, last but not least, what advice would you give to someone working at, as a, working at a startup as an engineer? For anybody. John? <laughs> you've hired, you've hired, or you purchased a lot of startup companies. Well, uh, well, I, I think the key, I, I don't know what the magic sauce is in terms of uh, uh, the break, kind of breakthrough creativity. Uh, but in my mind, it, it says a lot of effort, a, a lot of effort, and, uh, and a lot of openness and discussion uh, within the group. You know, we, we bought a company down in uh, uh, Santa Cruz. And it was, you could tell how active they were just by looking what, uh, at what the wave conditions were in uh, Monterey Bay. And, uh, you know, sometimes the phone would ring a long time on, uh, on certain days when, 
So it, it takes a lot of it takes a lot of, uh, of dedication and, and a lot of kind of stumbling around. I, I, I don't know. I might add something I think to that's that. There's an easy answer. I'm, I might add something to that, if I may, John, which is in addition to effort, the notion of saying yes when people come to you with an opportunity. You know, you'll the leaders in companies understand skills and they look at them and they'll come to people they think can contribute in a greater way. And uh, saying yes to those opportunities will create more opportunities for you. So I think that's a really important uh, thing to remember. Good night, everyone. <laughs> We're turning the lights out. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. We hope you have an incredible evening. And on Wisconsin. Cheers.